you know, this kind of the super, with massive superpositions, they are called entangled states, you know. And um, uh, at the same time, uh, around that time, also people started thinking about something which is called quantum error correction. So, that, and it was at least theoretically, you know, was supposed to be a solution to this problem. So what is quantum error correction? It's precisely kind of the idea of making this quantum uh, kind of evolution, kind of digital style, it's basically your kind of non-linearity if you want, you know, like in a classical system. But what you do, you basically use redundancy. And, you know, you can also have a error correction for classical information. And it's used, for example, for things like information transmission, where instead of just encoding, you know, one zero in one bit, you encode, for example, 10, take 10, you know, nine bits and encode nine zeros, you know. And, you know, if you then, you know, like let this, you know, state, you know, for example, transmit it or just keep it for a long time, if one of these bits, you know, flipped, you still have a lot of copies and you can basically by majority vote uh, figure out which ones are, you know, is it most likely zero to begin with or one. Now, in quantum mechanics, it's actually not completely obvious whether this idea can apply for multiple reasons. First, you cannot copy quantum information. So it's so-called no cloning theorem is actually a basis for things like quantum communication. So it's a fundamental principle of quantum mechanics, number one. Number two, uh, if typically in quantum mechanics, if you measure the state, you destroy it. So in fact, the reason why large quantum su superpositions do not exist can be understood as basically environment measuring. So even the mere fact that someone can actually figure out whether this table is here, there, or there, you know, it immediately collapses the state. But nevertheless, it turns out that you can use this redundancy to actually encode and protect quantum information. And the idea there is you basically use entanglement, you delocalize your, your quantum bit over so-called logical quantum bit now, encoded logical quantum bits, you delocalize over many physical quantum bits. And then what you do, you measure, you don't actually, don't measure this state completely, but then, you know, once in a while, you measure what's called stabilizers. You basically make a checks, you know, if, for example, like indicating whether, you know, you are still, you know, in the right kind of subspace, you know, and that helps you to kind of, you know, stabilize a uh, quantum state creates this non-linearity, similar to classical uh, analogy. And, you know, what uh, uh, the theoretical work by people like Peter Shor, Andrew Steen, John Preskill, earlier Alexei Kitaev, you know, also showed, you know, early on that you can, at least in principle, in theory, suppress the quantum errors, you know, using this approach to a very, very high degree. So, but, you know, because, you know, already to begin with, it requires, you know, to, to have a redundancy, to have several physical qubits to encode even single logical qubit. And actually, it requires you to prepare these entangled states. It's basically, in a way, like these big superpositions that are sometimes called schrodinger cat states. You know, the cat can be alive for that. Mm -hmm. So basically, quantum error correction, very counterintuitively, you basically prepare some small cat states to actually protect quantum information, very counterintuitive, counterintuitive. In fact, even like theoretically, the fact that it's even possible, it's amazing. But they actually, for reasons I just described, it turns out to be very, very hard to do, you know? Yeah, that's very interesting. Like yeah. using the, the logical uh, uh, qubits to do the quantum error correction. Exactly. And uh, so what is now this, I guess it is now uh, like the state of the art in terms of uh, the uh, quantum error. So what's what do you, what what is the standard now, and then how do you see it can be moved to the level of uh, okay. ten to the minus nine? Okay. So okay, so basically, among the challenges to really make this useful is one: you need, you know, redundancy. You need to have many physical qubits to encode single logical qubit. You also need um, uh, to uh, have the operations to begin with to be very good. There is something which is called threshold theorem. So basically, if any operation you do introduces more errors than corrects, you're sort of doomed, right? 
So that's why there is so-called threshold theorem. So basically, physical operations should be very good to take advantage of this nonlinearity to begin with. And then finally, there is something which uh, 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 sometimes is called a control problem. So if you think about your uh, like a cell phone, right? It has a super powerful chip, you know. It has, it has, this chip has, I don't know how many billions of transistors, right? But if you think about how many wires control these transistors, is actually a lot of wires, but not billions, right? And so with this uh, quantum computers in particular, with error corrected, with this kind of quantum computers based on error corrected logical qubit, one problem is that if you already start building it with like ingredients where you need to control each physical qubit, in order to control a uh, logical qubit, you need to basically have like a lot of wires going on to actually even like just flip one bit or to control, protect one bit of information, qubit of information. And that actually makes it, it's a, it's a very hard, it's a very challenging control uh, 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 problem. And so for this reason, up to basically, you know, December of last year, um, uh kind of state-of-the-art experiments which were like totally ingenious you know extremely you know i mean very impressive um controlled you know systems of one and two maybe one of in one of experiments there was three logical qubits which at most have done you know one or two operations you know and so for example like uh, google about a year ago uh, early last year they had a paper where we realized you know one logical uh qubit this logical qubit did not you know you won't do anything, so it's actually it's just you know, they try to maintain, keep it alive, you know. And they sort of came just kind of to the break-even point, but it kind of indicates the you know the challenge, you know. So in the work which actually uh, which was just recently published in Nature, so we made some advance to this field, and uh, um, so what we did, we have basically demonstrated, you know, several kind of like key ingredients of this um, uh, quantum error correction. One of them was we showed that if we start just with two logical qubits, but we increase their size, you know, we could do a quantum logic operation between them such that it improves with the size. And that's a hallmark. So basically by increasing redundancy, you know, we improve the operation, which to begin with is extremely counterintuitive. We create this larger and larger cat state, which should be more and more fragile, but it actually results, you know, we do it in the right way. So it improves the operation. And then, in another um, kind of uh, set of experiments, we have implemented quantum circuits with up to 48 logical qubits. There were small qubits in this case, uh, but nevertheless, we performed algorithms which involved, you know, hundreds of, of gate operations, you know, up to now the record was two, you know. Uh, so, and we have implemented the algorithm, which is actually complex, which is hard to simulate classically. So, um, and the key ingredient for that is that, you know, we were able to solve this control problem. And it's actually done by optics. It's kind of you guys are optics crowd, so uh, you can maybe sort of appreciate it. So like, so in particular, uh, the, the idea is we use the techniques like special light modulators and acoustic deflectors. The, the, um, uh, it's basically, it's a device, which is, I think, similar to what's used in supermarket scanners, you know, uh, barcode scanners. But it turns out to be very powerful because basically there with one, knob with one voltage you can address for example a set of qubits which you know in the kind of desired way which includes you know a large number you know and it's very very powerful because basically with one with one control mechanism we now can control logical qubits rather than physical qubits so that was a key innovation of this work and you use this combination because the aod the um, acoustic optic deflector has a faster refresh then the SLM? Can you also just completely yeah. reconfigure the SLM? The, yes, that's it. So this kind of the SLM, is, you know, for those of you who know, is actually an amazing uh, kind of tool by itself. So it's basically a computer-generated hologram where you can basically, with some input, you know, com you know, computer input, you can, you know, create an arbitrary light pattern. Um, but it does have one drawback. It's actually slow. And so basically what we do now in the current generation of our experiments, we use a combination of SLMs to create the background static traps. And um, we use uh, acoustic optic deflectors um, to actually move traps around. 
and I should kind of note here that there is another very important ingredient which I which I did not mention so far, and this is something we already demonstrated almost two years ago. Um, using uh, okay, in our approach, what we do we use cold atoms to encode physical qubits, and these atoms are stored in optical tweezers and focused beams of light, and this is good for many reasons. So first, the atoms are extremely well isolated. You know, these atoms are basically atomic clocks, which, you know, other qubit systems are not. Uh, and, um, and most importantly, once atoms are stored, trapped in these optical tweezers, they can be moved around. And what we demonstrated, you know, about two years ago is that actually we can change the... Uh, the connectivity of our processor in real time. So to basically to gain step back, typically if you make a processor, right? If you like, if you know the processors which powers your phones and computers, you know they're designed, you know, and they're fabricated using you know optical lithography, you know UV, you know lithography, you know. But once it's fabricated, it's fixed. The connectivity, everything was designed at the time when it was the chip was designed. So what we have were actually able to show is that by using these atoms and optical tweezers, we can actually reconfigure the archite architecture. We can change the connectivity in such a way that this, you know, the connectivity, it's itself like our processor is like a living organism. And this is enabled now by these acousto-optic deflectors. So we can actually move columns and rows of atoms independently, you know, relatively quickly in such a way that the way which atoms talk to another atoms, you know, which qubits talk to other qubits, you know, you, you know, changes in time. And that's the key which allows us now to control logical, to exercise control over systems, basically looking at logical qubits rather than physical qubits.